Okay, the last time we talked, I introduced the finite state machine. And I've got a couple of lectures I need to go through simply because they may not show up on your final exam, but they show up, will show up on other finals. And I know it specifically this is the format that uh, some of the universities in Australia use for finite state machines. It's a little different than we typically use in the U.S., but I'm going to kind of go through this. And what this particular, this is a small finite machine that's ca typically called a sequence detector up there. Now, the format that they're using is the, the circle, and this is the, the name of the state right there. I normally don't use 0010011, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, 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 but they're using a gray code type state machine, you know, and that's actually the bit of the finite state machine if you were to design it using D flip-flops or JK flip-flops. that they're, I'm not going to talk much about designing finite state machines using flip-flops, nor am I going to talk about counters using flip-flops, mainly because it's not done that way a anymore. So probably the first half of today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the design of a finite state machine in terms of a finite state diagram like this here. And then I'm going to move over to VHDL and start talking about VHDL, which is a subject all of its own. We could spend an entire semester talking about VHDL. I'm going to dedicate about one and a half lectures to it. So you're not going to be VHDL experts. And again, the idea is that depending on where you go to school and what's around at school and where their graduates go, you may not see VHDL, you may see Verilog instead. If you're going to Australia, as I understand most of you are, some of the schools do teach VHDL there because they feed some of the some people that work in government contracts up there. So well, let's talk a little bit about this here. The, the finite state machine I talked about last time up there, and I'll come back to this slide, was a, a standard stoplight, and we'll come that there, where if you have a stoplight here, two stoplights, here, and we're going to assume that this is a north-south stoplight. There's two stoplights, one on the north end looking south and one on the south end looking north, and, that, and they control the traffic going north and south, and then there's a stoplight going east and west. Now, <coughs> I shouldn't say this, but typically I found in Kuala Lumpur, at least, none of the roads run east-west, north-west, or east, north-south, east-west. They all run in angles of various types and running around in circles, but I'm kind of used to cities like New York or Chicago where if you go to New York City, for example, in, in Manhattan, at, on, the, on the lower end, it starts at First Avenue, works its way north, and then on the west side, it starts on First Street and moves up going as you go west right there. So in other words, all the avenues are going up, are going north, or, are going east-west and they start starting the south and go up and they're all in numbers that's there. So if someone tells you that they live on the corner of 35th and 19th, you know where it's at. It's very easy to find, you know, find your way around. Uh, Milwaukee is the same way, only they start at, the, at Lake Michigan and they work up as you move away from the lake. And then they, that, that's the avenues, the streets actually use use uh, names, but they're all alphabetical. <laughs> As you start at the southern end of the city, the streets start with A, you know, A, 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 B, A, C, and they work their way up until you get to like Wyoming or that there, which is toward the north end of the city. So there's a very neat orderly pattern for laying out cities. Unfortunately, the British are well known for have, building cities in circles and strange angles, and they design much of Paul and Poor. That's there. And if you've ever been to London, you'll find that it's the same mess as you find here. <laughs> that there. Of course, being an American who lived in Eng England, we always made fun of the English that there and the way that they laid out their streets. But you got to remember, a lot of the streets in the UK were laid out before there were cars, so it made sense to build cities around circles, you know, around the city center. Regardless, we're assuming that we're we're on a normal street here, right here. And I'll come back to this example later, right here. And this is north, this is south, 
this is west, this is east, and I've got this stoplight here is here and here, and they control the direction of the traffic going this way, right there. I don't know what side of the road I'm on here, I'm just arbitrarily that there. The east-west are here and here, and they control the traffic going this way, right there. So in a normal traffic light pattern, that there, you will start out, and I'm going to make the assumption that we have two timers available to us, that there. And our timer, one timer is called a long timer, and the other call, timer is called a short timer. That's there. And I should point out that I'm going through this specific example for a reason. And I think you probably guess what the reason is. That there is that one of these two problems very, very likely might find their way onto your final exam. Mm -hmm. That there. So, so it, it would pay to kind of understand how these what these work. So we have these two timers, long timer and short timer. And I'm going to make the assumption that these timers are automatically started whenever we change states right there. You know, we, I won't get into the detail because the detail is involved in our HDL programming of the timers, and we're not going to go into as much HDL programming as it takes to actually design this thing as a lab. When I teach a full course on on VHDL, this is actually probably like the fourth or fifth week lab. You know, I actually make everyone do this project. So I've seen this project done at least. Uh, let's see, I've taught you know, digital two every year for the last 12 years. I have average of 25 students in the class who work in pairs. So I see 12 groups a semester times two semesters a year. So that tells you how many different implementations I've seen of this design. <laughs> a couple of thousand to say at least, that there. And every group does it slightly different. So, so I've seen this done as a design. I'm not going to teach it in this course here because you don't have four weeks of VHDL to get into that detail on how to start timers. But what we, I am going to teach is how we would design the finite state machine into our bubble graph, that there. Because there are software design tools out there, and we're not teaching them in this class, and we don't have them on this campus, because Cordis does not have it. Sidelinks includes it in their tool set, and Sidelinks is Altera's competitor in the world. You know, as you know, in Malaysia, there's two car companies, Proton and Perdua, right? Peridua, is that how you say it, Peridua? Up there. And they compete for the business of people wanting to buy Malaysia-made cars. Now I think Proton is a government linked company, is Peridua as well, or is it a private company? Does anybody know the answer to that? I don't know the answer. Well, regardless, that there but there's two large car companies in Malaysia that produce cars and they compete with each other. <coughs> in the United States there's General Motors and there's Ford and there's Chrysler. You know, those are the three competitors. Well, in the digital world, in FPGAs and CPLDs, there's two competitors. One is Xilinx, which we don't talk much about, and the other is Altera, which we've used in our labs. That there, Xilinx includes a software package with their with their toolkit, which is very similar to Cordis, called StateCAD. Now, StateCAD allows us to just draw the drawing that they're like we're going to do here. And then StateCAD will then write the VHDL code for you in order to implement the, the design. As it turns out, an experienced VHDL programmer or designer, I shouldn't use the word programmer, there usually prefers to write the VHDL themselves. That their students love it when the software writes the software, their students, when the software writes the VHDL or Verilog forum, but later, once they get used to writing the VHDL, they prefer to do it themselves because it's probably it's usually more efficient. But regardless, we're going to be looking at this here. So we're going to start out with, and I'm just going to list my states, and I'll come back to this one here later, up there. So I'm going to list my states, and we're going to start off 
and we're going to say that our north south is going to be green right there. In other words, when we first turn on this system right there, this stoplight, north south is green, which means east and west should be red, right? Bad things happen when east or south are green and east west are green at the same time. Typically, cars crash into each other. So we want to make sure that our state's not there. And then north south is green for a long time, right there. And, and, and I'm putting this long time there for simply to, to say that we're going to stay in that state until a long timer expires. That's there. So when we go, when we start this up, long timer automatically starts up, and it's going to keep running until it expires. So we're going to look at that right there. When long timer expires, while it's running, it's equal to zero. That means it's not expired. LT is equal to one when it's expired. Right there. So. So we're going to assume that we've got this timer over here that whenever we go into a state, it automatically just goes to zero and it's going to stay at zero until a certain amount of time ex you know, passes. I notice that in Malaysia, stoplights are very, very long. I mean, I've seen stoplights are three, four minutes. That's there. You know, usually I'm used to stoplights that run anywhere from 60 to 45 seconds. That's there. Stoplights seem to run a long time here which kind of leads to the reason why people tend to run them that there. If you know you're going to be waiting five minutes for the next green light, people tend to want to run the stoplight. If you know it's going to be less than a minute or two, then you tend to stop. That there. I, you know, I'm kind of analyzing this stoplight running behavior that I see, and I do notice that I get frustrated at how long the lights are. And I actually timed a few of them, and I actually sat at red lights for over five minutes in a couple of cases. That there. So they tend to be long. But regardless of how long they are, in my political commentary on stoplights, that there, we have a timer. Then we're going to go to our next state is going to, we're going to have north-south, it's going to be yellow. And this time we're going to wait for the short timer to expire. Remember we have two timers here. One is a long timer, one is a short timer. So yellow is going to stay yellow for five, ten seconds, that there. And the idea of a yellow light is that if you're approaching the intersection and you can stop, you're supposed to stop. Now, I, I also notice that some people, and I've actually received a ticket from the U.S. or the Indiana State Police one time for seeing a yellow light and pushing a little harder on the accelerator to go through it faster. And they actually pulled me over and gave me a, actually they gave me a warning for it. But, you know, so I, so I know that the tendency sometimes when you see that light turn from green to yellow is to hurry up and get through it before it turns red. Some places that's against the law, and they actually will give you tickets for it, as I have a little piece of paper somewhere in my house. I think I threw it away, but saying, you know, don't, don't do that, don't do that anymore. Right there. So, but we have the short timer, and that short timer means that it's going to turn red. And then what we're going to go to next, and my stoplight is a little special, that there is I'm going to set a state called north-south red and east-west red and this is going to also go a short short timer and you know what let me not put this one in I put that in my in my homework but it's not in the, the problem that problems that I wrote for my test bank so let me not add that additional state I set that up as part of my part of the design project that there's a short short timer called red red where both lights are red for like two or three seconds to try to prevent accidents <laughs> that there in other words we don't go from east north south north south is yellow and normally most stoplights go to north south goes red the same time east west goes red right or goes green well my stoplight they both stay red for a short period in order to, one, catch the people that are going too early on the north, east, west, so we can give them a ticket, but also to prevent accidents that they're to, in order to ensure. So, in my, in my ideal stoplight, there would be north, south is green. It stays green for 35, 40 seconds. That there, 45 seconds. Then it goes yellow for about five seconds. 
that it goes red for like two or three seconds where both that there and then the east west would go green welcome that there <coughs> so I'm not going to do that this time we'll talk about how we would add that in but we'll just go ahead so our next stop so we're going to go there and we're going to use a short time for that right there and then after that we're going to go to another state called east west green and we use the long time for that we go east west yellow and we use a short time for that and then we go back to our start right there so that's our basic stoplight design that there we would have. So how would we do this in a bubble graph implementation right there? Now, here we're going to be using what they, a, a there, I'm going to use two different forms of doing this right here. And one is I'm going to use the normal bubble graph and right there. And our no, normal bubble graph is we start out as north, south, green and we stay there as long as long timer is equal to zero when long timer goes to one we go to north south yellow we stay there as long as short timer is equal to zero when it goes to long sh short timer excuse me whenever short timer goes to one we then go to east west green and we stay there as long as our long timer is equal to zero when long timer is equal to one we then go to our east west yellow state and we stay there as long as our short timer is equal to zero whenever it goes to one short timer is equal to one we go back to that there so this is the basic bubble graph design for our stop flight right there you know I went through a lot of discussions to get to this very simple answer how what what the design looks like now we're not done yet <laughs> that there we're not done yet because this just basically tells our finite state machine how it's going to behave now I've left out of this discussion how we would design our timers and they're very simple timers that there all we do is we load into a register a number and we count down until it equals zero and then we just simply set the output to one and we go into a, we idle until it started again right there so that there so and of course we're using two different timers with two different time periods right there so these are our this is a very simple one there the next thing we need to talk about is our output right there. Now our outputs there, there are two different finite state machines. One's called a Mealy and one's called a Mealy More. I'm not going to get into the difference too much and I'll tell you what, let me just go online real quick here and to be honest, the reason I'm going on t online is because I confuse the two of them on occasion. Mealy More right there make sure we get the two of them right right there and again basically comparison right here here implement mealy more right there and I will almost guarantee you will be asked the difference between a mealy and a more finite state machine even though I know the difference, but I don't always remember which one I'm using. That there, I can't remember, but you have to remember the difference. <laughs> that there, that there. One of them uses only the current state for the out, determine the outputs. The other one uses the current state and the inputs. I tend to use the one that only uses the current state, right there. Right there. So. As we look at the okay, this is the difference you need to remember right there. More state machines, the output depends only on the current state. That's what I tend to use. That's what I'm going to be using in my examples. Mealy depends on the current state and the inputs right there. 
in terms of graphics right there if we look at here's our finite state machine we then take our current state and I can't write today I'm just going to say current state and we go through some combinational logic right there and here are our outputs this is a more state machine right there a mealy state machine we take our finite state machine here's our current state we have some inputs here in our case our inputs are our long timer and our short timer we can put other inputs such as pedestrian crossing push buttons sensors and right turn lanes we have all kinds of inputs we can add to you know I've been known to take our the stoplight problem and, and actually run that into an entire semester by just making the problem project more and more difficult. By the time they're done, they've got four stoplights that are synchronized. <laughs> That's there. So I mean, something as simple as a stoplight can actually fill up an entire semester. That there. So that there. And we've got here's our combination logic right there. And we take some of our inputs and they go into our combination logic right there. So I typically tend to avoid this type of finite state machine. So anything you're going to see on me on a final exam would use the more stop, more right there. So as you go back to my definition that we had right here, more stop, a, a more machine the output depends on the current state only. In other words, we don't look at our inputs. My rule of thumb when I design finite state machines is that you have a unique set of, a unique state for every set of outputs that you want. It just makes life simpler. That there. So, a Mealy machine means that we can look at our inputs and our current state and, and set up different puts, outputs. Mealy machines tend to be more complicated in terms of the combination of logic. They tend to be more convoluted. That there, they have fewer states right there, but there there are other problems. They, that there. <coughs> the other thing about a mealy finite state machine is that it may or may not be synchronous. A more state machine, if you have, if you're using a Synchronous uh, finite state machine design, and we'll talk about that using VHDL in a minute. That there, the the outputs only change on clock edges. Immediately, you could have asynchronous inputs that change things right there. So change outputs. So I tend to avoid the immediately, and that's one of the reasons I don't necessarily remember more immediately because I only use one for real projects. That, that there. You know, so when I talk about finite state machines, I'm always talking about a more finite state machine, whether that's there. So keep in mind that you will see the question. I can guarantee you will see the question, what is the difference between a mealy and a more machine? That's there. I can almost tell you that it's worth three points. <laughs> that there. So, I, you know, so I'm just warning you right now that that, that, that question will be there. <laughs> So, okay, going back to my discussion here, we have four states right there, right there, and our four states are north, south, red, as I define it, north, south, yellow, east, west, green, excuse me, I'm, I can tell this is, this is like a Monday morning up there, I don't do Monday mornings, so. So Tuesday, Mondays, when we don't have classes, makes Tuesday the equivalent of a Monday morning, right? So, so I'm allowed to make mistakes up there. So we north, south, green, east, west, yellow. North, south, green, north, south, yellow, east, west, green, east, west, yellow. Those are our four states right there. 
So we have to specify our outputs for each of the four states. Now in our particular case, we've got six outputs right there. And when you're in VHDL, you have to be careful. You cannot use the same names for outputs as you use for states. Same thing with Verilog, same thing with life in general. So you don't want to reuse the same names. So I just put an L at the end of it right there. And my outputs are my north, south, red light, my north, south, yellow light, north, south, green light, east, west, red light, east, west, green, yellow light, and east, west, green light, right there. Let me clean that up there. This is supposed to be a yellow light right there. So those are my outputs in this particular case right there. And really all you need to do, you know, is just simply say for each state, what are the outputs right there. In our particular case, our state north-south green, we know that our north-south red light is off, our north-south yellow light is off, our north-south green light is on. I'm using positive logic here, that there. My east-west red light is on. You want to make sure you got that one right, that there. My east-west yellow light is off. My east-west red, or excuse me, Green light is off right there. And you would list that for each of the four states. And that would finish the design process right there. So, and as I said, on any final exam, I'm not going to go beyond the design process. So the design process is really specifying your states and what your outputs are. Your next step after this would be to write the VHDL to do that. And we're not going to get into VHDL deep enough to write that, or Verilog. You know, I talk about VHDL as if it's the language. There are two languages, and I mentioned it before, I'll go into a little bit more detail here later, later in the hour. Right there. So that's how you would do a stoplight, right there. So depending on which final exam I use, you may see that problem or something similar to that right there. The next one is a little bit messier, and this is a sequence detector. This uses, this particular one is actually a simpler finite state machine, that there, and it's showing here basically what we've got he, he, here is, these are the state names. So this particular one has four states, zero, 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 and I'm going to draw it the way you can draw right here. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, and zero, one. These are the four states that we have in our finite state machine here. Now, in the one that I did here before, I used the states NSG, NSY, that there. I prefer those names that there, but it just so happens that you know, I was asked to teach the way that they teach there at, uh, at there. These, uh, these state names actually are the outputs of the D, the D flip-flops or JK flip-flops if you're designed this manually, right there. <coughs> when you're working with a high-level language like VHDL or Verilog, you don't really care what the outputs of the flip-flops are. You let this, you let the compiler decide that for you, that there. That's, you, you, you think at a higher level. You, you think at this level right here, that there. This is a simpler circuit, but it's actually more, it's, to me it's an uglier circuit, <laughs> that there, in the way that they, they approach it. It's an awkward way, but it's the way that you're gonna be expected to at least see it once right there. Now what they're showing here is, they're showing, if I, Make sure I've got this right here. They're showing our state transitions and our outputs here. 
So we start out at zero, zero, and if we've got a one, we're going to go to this state down here. And our output is going to be a zero. So when you see this, one slash zero means it's going, to, that's our, our transition. That's very similar to what I did here, where I said LT is equal to zero and ST is equal to one. The reason I do it this way is that I'm dealing typically in VHDL with more than one input and more than one output right there. So this particular way is designing a manual state machine with only one input and one output right there. So if you're dealing with one input and one output, this is showing what the input is and which direction you're going and what, we, what our output is going to be right there. So when we look at this state transition right here, let's just look at the first one here, zero, zero, right here, and we show zero slash zero, means that if our input is a zero, we stay in the same state. If our input is a one, we go down here, and our output in both cases is a zero, right there. So it's a relatively messy way of doing it, but it's the way that was done with relatively very simple finite state machines that were designed by hand. And one of the reasons we went to Verilog and VHDL is because we can design much more complex finite state machines and not have to deal with this very tedious <laughs> right there. But regardless, I've been asked to go through this. There, I have not designed a finite state machine this way in probably 15 years. <laughs> that there is somewhat of an obsolete method when we look at high level lang or design languages. But let's kind of look at this here. And this particular finite state machine is a sequence detector. And it's looking for a particular sequence. I'll let you figure out what the sequence is as we go through here. And what we've got here is this is the input that we're going to use for our finite state machine right here. It's a series of numbers that's going to come in on a serial port and we're going to traverse through this finite state machine and see how it works right there. And we're going to be looking at the output. The best way to do this is actually to write a table right there. So I'm going to actually, uh, let me erase this, and I'm going to copy this to a, up right there. And let me copy this to a, Another copy. Right here. Okay. And the reason I did this is we're going to start off here, and we're going to assume that we start off here, and I'm going to call current state right here, right there, our current state what our input is, what our next state is, and our output right there. Right there. And we're just going to go through here, and we're going to look at our inputs right here, right there, and let me, right there, and go through them bit by bit. And as I go through a bit, I'm just going to put a line through it right there. So we start off as our current state is zero, zero right there. Our first input is a zero right there. So I'm going to write the zero there. If we get a zero, we stay in the current state. So our next state is going to be still zero, zero. Our output is right here, out right there. We get that there. And then I line through that right there to show that I've gone through that one. My next input is a one, right? If I get a 1, my next state is 0, 1. So our current state is 0, 0. And that's the same as we copied this to this right there. That there. Our input is a 1. We get that from this table here. My next state is 0, 1. We go down to here. See, we're, see if this is a 1, we go down to here. So my next state is 0, 1. And my output comes from here. It's still a 0. We did this one right there. So we carry the zero one, oh, zero one to here. 
My next input is a zero, right there. So if we're in zero one, we get a zero, we go back to zero zero. And my output in this particular case looks like it's a one in this particular case. So we get a one out right there. Oh no, not, yeah, yeah, that's right. I go down to here and I go back to right there. So I put a one out right there, right there. So that there. So we go ahead and we mark through that zero, and we put zero zero here, right there, because that's our next state. Right there. Our next input is a one. So we go back to zero one right there. Right there. We go back to zero one, and our output is a zero right there. Again, we copy that from right here. So we line through this one. Now, now we've got a one here, right here, at there. So our you know, first off, let's go ahead and write our next state right here, which is zero one right there. Make sure we. I, I need to draw these lines here because right there. Okay, so our next state is zero one. Our next input is another one. So in this particular case, we go to state one one right there, and my output is a zero right there. So we go ahead and write the one one here. We line through this one here. Or in one one, my next, my output, my input is a zero. So I go looking at the table here. We go back to state zero zero. And my output is a one. Right there. So we write zero zero here. My next input is a 1, so we go to 0, 1, and my output is a 0. Again, I'm doing that because I've gone through that sequence multiple times. And I think you can see how the pattern works here, right there. So, right there, and we, we can go ahead and finish this. It's kind of a drawn out pattern. We did, we just finished that 1 there, right? So we have another 1. We're at zero one. We have another one. We go to state one one, and our output is a zero, right there. One one, right there. My next input is a one again. So if I've got a one in this particular case, I go back up to here, right there, and my output is a zero. So we go to one zero. My input is a 1, we go to 1, 0, and my output is a 0. Right there. So we're, we're now in state 1, 0. And our input is a 0. So if our input is a 0, we go back to 0, 0. And my output is a 1, right there. And you can see how tedious this type of problem is right there. But this is, if you see this kind of problem right here, what you're going to see is you're going to see this drawing, and you're going to see this sequence, and you're going to be asked to come up with this table right there. So what you have to understand to do that is how to read this graph. So when we to read this graph, is when you see a bubble like this, this is the state name, 1-1. One, one. So this is state 1-1 one, one or state 3. Now, you may also see it as 3 like this right here. Right there. Or in my case, I did NSG, NSY, ESG, ESY. That's just a name for the state right there. If you see the, this very simple one where it's got something that looks like this, zero slash zero, 
the top one is what the input is in order for it to take that path, and the bottom one is what the output is. Right there. If you have the more complex one, we handle the outputs separately. And if it's a more complex one, it would usually have the variable name. It would not just have zero. In my case, I had two inputs, short time and long time, so I had to specify which one was high or low. So, but that's basically how finite state machines work in bubbles, as far as bubble graphs up there. So I will go through this problem again, both of these, as I review for the final, because... You know, I'll tell you right off the bat, question five on the final deals with finite state machines. What the problem is, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that there is at least one problem that's going to talk about finite state machines. And the format of the final exam is five questions. You have to answer all five, so you can't skip the problem in this case. That there is one of the course learning outcomes for this objectives for this course that I'd be able to test that you covered finite state machines. <laughs> that there. So there will be a question on finite state machines and it will be one of these two types. There will definitely be knowing the difference between a Mealy and a more finite state machine, even though your instructor did not know the, know the difference. I knew, what the, I knew the difference, but I couldn't remember which one was which. I actually had a good idea, but I also run on a equivalent of a Monday morning about a 30% chance of guessing, remembering it wrong. So it's better for me to look it up out there. In real life, it doesn't matter so much, other than if someone tells you that they're more of an academic Again, I always use the more because I think it's a simpler design process. You only worry about the state transitions when you design the fi finite state machine. You worry about the outputs later as you go through and specify what your outputs are for each state right there. So, you know, another example of a finite state machine, this one will not be on the final exam because it's a much more complicated but one that I always like to give, for example, is a washing machine. And I use the washing machine here in my microcontroller course, in microprocessor course, as an example of doing finite, finite state machines with microprocessors. And I should mention that finite state machines are not limited to digital electronics. You will find them in programming, applications, you will find them in almost every type of control application right there. When we look at something like a washing machine, which we would probably not do using a digital programmable logic device, we would probably use a microcontroller, we would still use a finite state machine to specify how it works. So a washing machine, and I'm just going to list the state that we would normally have that there. I know our three gentlemen over here probably have never seen a washing machine, right? Or never used one, right? Is, is that the case? That there? Your mother's all made you use them, right? That there. So, I don't know. Here, do you use the, you don't have them in the, in the households. You have to go to the, dope, they call that what, the Adobe, the laundry mat here? That there. But a washing machine is one of these machines that does what, that washes clothes, right? That's the goal. So you put your clothes in, and you hit the start button, right? That's an input. And it goes into a state where it fills the washing machine. And I'm going to call that fill one. It fills up the washing machine with water, right? That's there. You can't wash clothes without water, so it fills the washing machine. There's a sensor in the washing machine that says that it's full. Once it reaches full, equals one, it goes into a wash cycle right there, right? And here it starts some timer. And I'm going to call it a long timer that there. It starts a timer, and with this timer, long timer is equal to one, it's going to go to the drain cycle right there. It's going to drain the washing machine. And when it's empty, there's another sensor that knows that when it's empty, it's going to go into a spin cycle spin one, where it gets all the excess water out, right? And then once that timer, and I'm going to call it long timer two, is equal to one, you know, it spins for so many minutes, that there, that there, when it's done spinning, 
it's going to fill back up again right there and then when it's full it's going to go to the rinse cycle where it's going to agitate and get all the soapy water out and it may repeat that and then at the final end you're, you're going to end up with a final spin right there that has a timer timer spin equals one you know whenever it expires and then we goes back to idle right there and it sits there and waits for you to take the clothes out so we could come up with a finite state machine to specify how a washing machine works right there now designing this finite state machine if we were to do it with a bubble graph would be pretty messy that's why I did it in a table form as we as our finite state machines get messier and messier I actually go away from using the tables or the uh, bubble graphs and I go to using an Excel spreadsheet back right there so but again we can define how a wash machine is, works with a finite state machine right there you could look at any almost any type of appliance in a normal household kitchen a refrigerator is a finite state machine. It's a very simple one. It just me measures the temperature. If it's below a certain point, it turns off the compressor. If it's above a certain point, it turns on the compressor right there. If the door is open, it turns on the lights. I mean, there's various inputs, but we have multiple states for a refrigerator. An oven, a microwave oven has, is, can be defined as a finite state machine right there. I have one of these, micro, you know, coming from the West, I, I'm used to using ovens for baking food. I know that's not a common thing in Eastern cooking to use a, to, to bake brownies or cakes. I think most cakes I've seen have been ste are steamed, aren't they? Up there. I know fruit cakes and some of those are steamed, but when my wife moved to, to the U.S., she looked at this big thing in my kitchen called an oven and wondered what it was for. She knew what the microwave was, but the oven was, uh, it was a strange appliance because that's there. So I've got an oven, a microwave oven that's also a convention oven that I can use to bake brownies and cakes and roasts, things like that. So it's got multiple uh, modes of operation. Each state there, it's got a preheat cycle, it's got a cook cycle where it counts the timer down. It's got a, and all these things can be defined using a finite state machine. So it's, it's very important that you look at it. You'll see them again in other courses. That's there. So that's all I'm going to say about finite state machines today. Now I'm going to go through and spend a little bit of time in, how am I on time? I, I, I know I've got plenty of time. I didn't start right on time, but yeah, I got at least a half hour I can spend. Okay, right there. And I'm going to go through some stolen slides. I just stole them this morning. I've got my own slides but at there, but I, I didn't bring that there. And I'm going to talk about We don't want this slide here or that there. And, and uh, here we go. My two sons. That there. As you can see, there. I'm the short one and, and the thin one out of the group. That there. So this was at my youngest son's wedding. So you can see he's the one getting married. He's, He's got about that there, so but uh, my my two sons are, in, and they, they have less hair than I do, if you can believe that. Of course, they shave their heads. <laughs> that there. So this one is a former Marine, so he's the tough guy. That there. Okay. Let me kind of talk a little bit about this. Comes from a two-day workshop from India a couple years ago. As I said, I stole his slides. That there, which. I'm not above stealing slides, especially when they put them on the internet and say steal us, steal us, steal us, right? Out there. So, but this is the introduction to VHDL. And when we look at HDL, we're talking a hardware design language is what it is right there. So, this is getting into a little, a little bit of background in the early days, digital systems were done manually using Boolean expressions, schematics, card off maps, blah, 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 out there. There, and that's what we've been doing all semester, right? Unfortunately, circuits have become too complex right there. 
with increasing device intensities, this choice of traditional methods has become somewhat limited. By the way, the individual, I, as you just what, noticed that I sold these slides, steal, I'm borrowing the slides, I shouldn't say stealing them sometimes, not saying they're mine, they're, you know, I left his name on them as I go through the presentation. That there is, is English is not necessarily American English, so I'll have to struggle a little bit there. But it says, well, we get the more than 600 gates traditional design methods start to fall apart. You know, we've looked at designs that have been 20 gates, 15 gates, and you know, when I talk 20 gates, we're looking at, say, for example, a JK flip-flop, it's got about 10 gates, in, or 6 gates inside of it. So we're looking at circuits with 4 JK flip-flops, we're looking at 16 to 30, 20 gates up there. They're already starting to get a little messy, right? Mm -hmm. that there. So you can you imagine doing something such as our washing machine controller using you know using Cardinal maps and gates and finite state machines using traditional methods. And we didn't even I didn't even cover how you would do that with Cardinal maps. It's in the textbook, by the way. I just skipped that part simply because it's it's tedious. I had to do it that way as a student, but I'm not going to go back and sh that there. I use these methods here, up there. and as you you'll see, as we get into PhDL design a state finite state machine or a counter. And by the way, a counter is another form of finite state machine. Right there, it is a very simple finite state machine. A counter that counts from zero to nine and resets there. All it is is a counter that changes on every. The state changes, has no input, it just changes every clock cycle right there. So right there. So we, we come up with methods right there. So they come up with something, electronic design automation, EDA, right there, that's a whole industry, there's a whole lot of garbage right there. But they come up with something called a hardware description language right here, right there, HDL. There are two HDLs out there today. There's actually more than two HDLs. It resembles a general programming like C, but it's not a programming language. One of the key things that I need to highlight here is if you're dealing with any HDL, Verilog, VHDL, uh, hardware description C, you know, there's actually a version of C that's used to describe hardware. It's not a programming language, and if you think of it as a programming language, you will have some serious trouble. I've taught VHDL to industry people. I've taught it to, you know, to college students, and the people that I've had the most trouble learning VHDL are seasoned industrial engineers that have been working in industry for 15 years or longer that have been designing Microsoft or uh, microprocessor programming design. They're thinking in terms of a programmer writing code for a microprocessor and they start writing VHDL going into a customized C, they struggle. It seems like the, the more experienced a programmer is, the more difficult they have with VHDL. That's it. And, we're, and I'm talking about people, some, some of them have master's degrees in electrical engineering, some of them have master's degrees in computer science, and they struggle with VHDL because they still think like a programmer. That there. So it's there. I also do a lot of work in microprocessors and in, in writing C code for microprocessors, both from the teaching aspect and in my industrial experience. So I cross both bridges, and I have to reprogram the brain a little bit every time I cross I'm using VHDL or I'm using C. They look similar to each other but you cannot use the same techniques up there. The most common use is to provide an alternative to schematics up there. One of the early versions of VHDL was a version brought out by a system called System, system Logic up there. It was a very large program it came on 52 floppies that took about half a day to install on your PC. This is before CDs and DVDs, software distributions. And actually, you would write your VHDL code and it would give you back the schematics for you. 
Actually, Altera will give you back somewhat of a schematic that there. They will give you the finite state machine and they will give you back, they'll give you a, a partial schematic of the circuit that, that it comes up with there. So, that there. It's very complex that there. And here he's talking about a multiplier, 16 by 16 bit multiplier, which is going to capture that it's going to require, we have two 16 bit inputs, one 32 bit process up there. 64 I.O., 6,000 gates. That's just for a circuit that's going to multiply two 16-bit numbers requires roughly 6,000 gates. Using VHDL, you could come up with that design in about five minutes. Up there. Doing, doing it with Altera and drawing the schematic will, spend, will take probably the better part of your week, if it works. That there. Try drawing a circuit with 6,000 gates and not making a mistake. That there. It's not easy, right there. So, that there. So he says it will take at least three days. I said the better part of a week. That there. So we. So I'm not. That there. I'm reading these slides for the first time. That there. So requires eight lines of text. I said five minutes. He says three minutes. So, you know. So I. You know. My guess is a little, you know, evidently I'm not as experienced as he is, so I said it was going to take me five minutes, or the better part of a week. He said it would take him three days and three minutes that there. Uh, I'm going more toward four or five days and about five minutes. But regardless, you're talking something relatively simple in, in an HDL to something very, very difficult. You can see the time savings involved right there. We're talking going from three days, and we use his time, to three minutes. We're talking three eight-hour days. We're assuming we're talking eight-hour days. He might be talking Indian days, and they may work 12-hour days, so his three days may be the equivalent of my five working days right there. So he may be talking 36 hours. He'll work 12-hour days. I'm talking you know, 32 hours working four. Out there. Regardless, we're talking... Three, three days to three minutes to do the same design right there. So VHTL is very simple right there. This is the code for our 16-bit multiplier. You can see how straightforward that is. We define the entity. We'll talk a little bit about the structure here later. And we define the architecture. And all we're going to say is we have two inputs. They're both standard logic, 15 down to zero, so they're 16 bits wide right there. We have an output that is 32 bits wide. The behavior of that is the output is A times B. There's our 8-bit multiplier, or 16-bit multiplier. Very straightforward. That's it. Very straightforward. Get there. Where, again, if we were to do this in hardware, what did we say? 6,000 gates. Now, we can simplify that a little bit by using standard logic and using that in Altera, but we're still talking a lot more work here, right there. So, you can see the motivation for using a hardware design language. It saves time. Up there. Up there. So the implementation, right there, three minutes to write. Again, he, now he admits that he stole this <laughs> from Xilinx, right there. And I just mentioned who Xilinx was, is their Altera's competitor, right there. So hardware has, right there, one text file, three minutes to write. Right there, completely. And this is another key right here. One of the reasons why we use VHDL is that it is completely independent of who you're going to be designing the hardware for. I can take Altera's core to software, I can design something, test it, and then my customer decides that I don't want to use Altera, I want to use Xilinx, I take that same file, I may have to make some minor changes to it, and I run it through the, through the Xilinx you know, IDE, you know, hard, 
they're the, they're the design platform. I can't remember the name of it. I have a copy of it at home. I don't. I haven't used it for a while, but uh, I could run the same DHDL design through their software and target one of their devices just as easily. You know, I worked for a company part time for many years. We did almost all of our design work with with Fortis. Almost all of our customers wanted the design in, for for Xilinx up there. Now. I mentioned Altera and Xilinx there. What I did mention is that Xilinx actually is about three times the size of Altera. They sell a lot more chips, but their design tools aren't as friendly. So a lot of people do like I do, and I'll use the Altera for doing the design work and the debugging, but then go to Xilinx, to, to Xilinx at the end for the implementation up there. It just so happens that Xilinx is a, their hardware is a full FPGA, it has some advantages, it's a little cheaper. But their design tools suck. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say they suck, they're, they're, they're better than they used to be. They used to really suck. Now they just marginally suck out there. Where the Altera, you know, and, and you guys have used it a little bit, you probably think that they're pretty nasty as they are, but they're the best of the industrial strength tools right there. Okay, there's two design languages out there. One is BHDL, that's what I'm talking about. The other is Verilog, I keep mentioning those right there. Verilog was, was developed by a company called Des Gateway Design Automation. It was a private implementation. There was no government funding or anything else. A they just came up with it on their own and, a lot of, and sold the compiler out there and a number of people bought it. It became very, very popular in some circles. BHDL was funded, designed, and specified by the U.S. Department of Defense. Right there. It was originally intended not to be a design language. BHDL was, was designed to be a hardware description language where if I sold an IC to the government, I would specify how that IC functioned in a VHDL file so that the government could go to another vendor and say, make me a chip that does this. That's there. So it was a hardware description language written, usually used for contract negotiations and specifications, right there. Every company that produced an IC for the government had to produce a VHDL file that went with it to define how that chip worked. Later, people figured out how to take that file and use it for simulation. Right there. And then later, a subset of that language was then synthesizable. In other words, you could write the description and the software will actually synthesize the hardware from the description. So that was not its intention. So it was not intended to be a design tool. It was intended to be a contract specification tool, later used for simulation. <coughs> and then finally it was used to design actual circuits at there. So it went through multiple iterations. Verilog from day one was a design tool. So as a design tool, Verilog is probably the better of the two. That's there. So, that there. But my experience is in, in, in VHDL. Almost all the textbooks are coming out of the U.S., so they all use VHDL. But if you went to a hardware company here that did designs, they're most likely going to use Verilog. The difference between the two looks more than it is. The mindset and the way you design things are still the same. That there. It's, it's, the syntax looks different. It's, now, everyone learned to program in this department. Your first programming language is C, correct? Your only programming language is C, correct? That's there. Back in, back in my day, my first programming language was something called Fortran. And I'm old enough that I took Fortran on punch cards. That there. You know, that was before terminals. That there. My second programming language was C. My third programming language was Pascal. My fourth programming language was Job Control Language. That there. My 
Probably my next programming language was assembly language. My next programming language was C. So you can see that over the decades, and I'm talking about 30 years, 35 years of experience, I've gone through about five different programming languages. How I think as a programmer it hasn't changed since my days in Fortran. Right there. That's the same thing as if I show you VHDL, how you think a job in hardware description language should not change if when you change to Verilog and use a different syntax. That's there. The, the, the design techniques are the same. As a young engineer, you are probably going to see at least four or five different hardware description languages in your career. You're probably going to see at least four or five different programming languages in your career. You're going to probably see at least a half dozen different simulation tools. So far you've learned one, which is what, electronic workbench or multi-sim? Is that there? Multi-sim used to be electronic workbench. That's why I keep going back to the old name, electronic workbench. That's there. You know, I've seen about four or five. Cadence is one that I've used. P-Spice is one I've used. I use the original Spice. I've used electronic workbench. I've used multi-sim. So I've gone through at least four or five different simulation languages. How I simulate drawing an op-amp circuit hasn't changed since day one. Out there. How I put it into the simulator and how I run the tools changes a lot. Out there. So as an engineer, you have to be able to adapt to new tools because they're going to change. Out there. They are going to change. That there. So, but both these hardware design and scripting languages have been around. VHDL, I like this slide. I, that's what I base deal. Is it a very hard, difficult language? That there. Most of the students think it is, but it's not. That there. But what it stands for is very high speed integrated circuits. That's actually an acronym of an acronym. It's the VISIC program that the Department of Defense ran. That's where that came from. Was there was a program called VISIC. That there, which stood for very high speed integrated circuits. That there, hardware description language. Now, notice that this is not design right there. It's not a hardware design language, it's a hardware description language. There are two types of VHDL out there there's the simulation VHDL, and then there's the synthesizable VHDL. They are different. Synthesizable VHDL is a subset. You can write VHDL and run it through a synthesizer or a simulator and simulate it, but you can't build the circuit. <laughs> the, you know, the, the software will not come up with a circuit to do that. Yeah. So, it's a language developed to describe complex digital circuits. That there, it's like a C language. It supports wide range of description types, structural, data flow behavioral mixed descriptions that's there, flashback again it goes back right there near the 80s is a little bit that's go, I already talked a little bit I'm not going to spend time talking about the physics program, 1980 Department of Defense, right there that there, again they developed it back in 83 or Texas Instruments final version was released in 85, again that was a, became an IEEE standard. IEEE took over it. The Department of Defense has nothing to do with VHDL anymore. It's IEEE actually controls both VHDL and Verilog. So they're both IEEE standards. And for those who aren't, don't know, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers is what IEEE is. It's the mothership of all electrical engineering, electronic engineering organizations. They come up with almost all the standards. I've been an IEEE member, went to a lot of their conferences out there. Yeah, what did I do here? Okay, I'm probably running out of my time slot here, but basically this is the design flow. We're not going to spend any time on that there. I want to just jump into here some terms here. We'll hear this term test bench, and those are helping generating input signals for simulation. We're using Quartus 9.2 or 9.1. I can't reverse reverse what Quartus is. Quartus 
in version 9 and older had a simulator built into it and we didn't have to write a test bench. At Recorders 10 and there on took out the simulator and put in a VHDL simulator which required that you generate a test bench for it. I am not going to, in the short time we're going to spend talking about VHDL, talk about generating test benches right there. Test benches are really very large input files that are used to test an IC to verify that it's doing what it's supposed to do. That's why it's called a test bench. Typically, if I design an IC for a company, and I've designed some ICs at, over the years, I have to also, when I submit my design to the fab fabrication in order to build the IC, I also have to supply a test bench. The test bench is what the IC manufacturer tests their implementation against. If my IC passes the test bench, I've bought that IC, whether it works or not. That's there. Now, when we're talking about buying an IC from a custom silicon manufacturer, we're talking something that costs around 100,000 rankings per chip or chip one. Chip two might only cost you two rankings, but chip one costs you 100,000. That's there. So it's very important that test benches are designed properly and that they actually test to make sure that it will work in the circuit. That's there. That's there. And that's an entire, you know, almost graduate program in designing test benches. That's there. So, that's there. So again, we can work at, VHDL allows the designer to work at various levels, behavioral, RTL, which is register transfer logic, Boolean expression, and gate. It's like C in the way that if you look at C and you haven't taken a course in microprocessors or microcontrollers, C I can get down to the register level inside the microprocessor and I can write very low level code or I can write very high level code. The C that you've taken thus far has been using Microsoft's uh, Visual Studio, correct? So you only wrote high level code. You did not get down to the microprocessor level or the hardware level. If you take the microprocessor course, here we look at C, we use the Kyle C compiler for the 8051, we get down to the register level right there. We get down right there. So you can go from very, very abstract to very, very specific in terms of hardware up there. So up there. Now we mentioned this right here, right here. These two are very, very important. And I'm going to kind of wrap this up and come back to this on Thursday. Is that one of the companies that I, that I spent probably most of the last, before I became a department chair, which was about six years ago, I've been here in Malaysia about a year. The last five years I was in the States, I was the department chair there. But prior to that, I did a lot of contract work for a company. And it was the Indiana Microelectronics Center, and we did a lot of design. And I probably spent 10 years, no more than that, probably close to 15 years or, or so, working for them on a part-time basis, sometimes full-time basis. I spent a sabbatical there full-time for six months. I spent every summer there for probably 10 years, 15 years. I worked there at least 15 hours a week for at least 10 years. So I spent a lot of hours working for them. And 90% of what we did is we designed using VHDL circuits that went into either Xilinx or Altera that ultimately then were translated into what's called an ASIC. An ASIC is an application specific IC that there. It's, you know, L you know, the Altera chip is CPLD. It's a complex programmable logic device. A Xilinx chip is a field programmable gate array. An ASIC is a fully customized chip. And what it is, is it's roughly 1 million, 2 million, 500,000 NAND gates on a single piece of silicon. And earlier in the semester we talked about all we need was NAND gates or NOR gates to do anything we wanted to do. That's there. And once we had our design working, 
we would send the PHDL file to a vendor that would then translate that design into a ASIC that was very, very cheap, very, very fast, and very, very small that would do that particular design. That's there. So we would do our designs in FPGAs or CPLDs, but ultimately what the customer was looking for was an ASIC. The reason they don't want a, something like an, an Altera or a Xilinx chip is they're big, they're expensive, they're bulky, they use a lot of power. An ASIC is, all, is just the power, does just what they want to do with no more, no less, and it's very, very cheap once you've bought the first chip. I mentioned before, you buy chip number one, it's 100,000 ringgit, chip number two is two ringgit. Normally, when you bought an ASIC, you bought five chips for 100,000 ringgit. They give you five with the first run. You test them, and if they're good, they're working, then you go ahead and order the next 10,000 to go into production. Right there. So we would do that there. Some industries use ASICs for very small runs. The Department of Defense in the U.S., that they're building, say, for example, a satellite. Well, well I won't use the Department of Defense, but say NASA. They're only building one satellite or five satellites. They still have to use an ASIC because they need very, very low power, very, very efficient, very, very hard. That they're. Generally, if you're dealing with a company like General Motors, they're going to be building five million cars. So they want the cheapest, small and cheap and as powerful as they can get. That they're. They don't care about the initial upfront cost. That they're. So, okay, I see people dozing off, picking their bags up, hinting that it's time to wrap up right there. So I will wrap up here. And I'm ready to, your, your clocks are programmed with me. As there, I say, I go an hour, 15 minutes. I'm still talking, but I notice that people are starting to doze off and pick up their bags as if it's time for me to end. So your, your clocks have 